Ladies and gentlemen, the government needs to have a really good reason to spend your money. They buy roads, they buy hospitals, they pay for education, and they pay for art. So pick the odd one out. All of the other things that I've just pointed to are an inherent good for everybody. And we, on the proposition, see no reason to continue funding art. And it cannot. And so we say that the difference is that the government is spending people's money on art, which they then consume. But the people are those who determine what art is. So they should be the ones to choose how we spend it. And so the problem that we identify on side proposition today is that we identify that it is not the role of the government to fund art because it's a consumer good and in doing so art is fund and undermined. So in definitional terms today we see arts as being performing arts like music, plays, no picture, literature and visual or physical arts like painting or sculpture. So we propose that the government no longer gives special grants to the arts or provides artists with tax breaks or any other special treatment exclusive to point, its own industry. No, thank you, sir. Now, our case is that we should no longer fund art because it is not intrinsically good and to do so undermines art. We would instead support letting the market decide. And so we'll be proving this to you today in five substantive points. First, that art's value is that which is attributed to it by its appreciation from people, not the government. Second, that the market is able to provide art that is necessary to the government. Third, third that funding from the government compromises the freedom, diversity and quality of art. Fourth, that this funding is unfair on other industries. And finally, that our model forces artists to engage with their communities on a grassroots yeah. level. Yes, please. But say that people actually wanted their art to be funded by the government, would you say then that then it's right for the government to fund the art? No, but if people want their art to be funded by the government, then what that assumes is just that people want access to good art. And we say that the way that they get that is through our model, where people let the market, where people themselves are making that decision. So we don't think that's actually true, because people at the base want good art, and we say that comes from our model. So this leads me to my first substantive argument, that art's only value is that which is attributed to it by the consumer. Now the premise to this argument, ladies and gentlemen, is that the purpose of art is to be appreciated by the people who see it. So the question we must ask is how do we determine the value of art in society and how do we deem what is artistic and deserves funding? And we have two options when we consider this. Either that a bunch of guys in a government department who can't even figure out where their ties and their socks match together <laughs> decide on what good art is, or secondly, that we let the people, the market, the consumers themselves decide what's art by being patrons or commissioning that art. No, thank you. And the reason this is a much better option is, it, is that because that is what provides us with the best art. Art, and firstly because art is appreciated, and when people appreciate art, they're willing to pay for it. And secondly, because people show their support with their wallets, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the best example of this is that people pay thousands of dollars to attend the Venice Biennale every year. And, what that, and it's now become a pinnacle of the artistic world. And what that proves in our argument is that people pay for what they want. And so that shows us that we can trust the market to decide on what's good art. Now this leads me not thank you, sir, to my second substantive argument, that the market will provide the art that people want. And the premise to this argument is that in the art industry, we want to give access to art that we want to give people the access to the art that they want to see. And we say that the market is the best determiner of what art should be provided and where. And there are several reasons why the market is better, and, they, and it can be provided in a number of ways. For example, with patrons, where people who like an artist so much are willing to pay that artist for, uh, to provide their art. Also with commissions, where if people want to see that art, then they'll pay for it. So the question we really are getting at here is, why are those people different to the government? And there are two reasons. Firstly, because those people, those patrons or those consumers or those commission, commissioners, 
are the consumers, so they're making that decision. And the second reason is because in that situation, the patron finds the artist, whereas when it's in a government situation, and I'll be addressing this in my third substantive, the artist has to, co has to compete with other artists for the government. So the government is being selective and not necessarily making a decision go off on the basis of the market. No, thank you. And we compare how well art does under a market situation compared with under a government situation. When we compare the San Francisco Philharmonic Orchestra with the Auckland Philharmonic Orchestra, ladies and gentlemen, and we see that the San Francisco Philharmonic Orchestra is one of the best in the world. And it's, and it's not at all funded by the US government. And this is compared with the Auckland one, which, take it from me, isn't that great. And what that proves to you is that the, the, is that because people are prepared to pay the money to see the Philharmonic Orchestra, they are just so much better and they are able to survive by themselves. And furthermore, because they have to rely on themselves, they have an incentive to be the best that they can. And that ensures that art is the best it can be and protects its quality. And this leads me to my third substantive argument today, that funding compromises yeah. the freedom, diversity and quality of art. And before I get into it, yes please. Sir. So you're saying that just because nobody likes a certain art, then that art shouldn't exist at all yet? Yeah, that's exactly the case of side proposition today. Thanks very much. That's exactly what we believe. If people don't like the art, that art should die. Because we believe that the market are the best people to decide what is good and what is bad, and we defend that decision. Okay, so the premise to why funding compromise, government funding compromises the freedom, diversity and quality of art is that art should be a free medium because we say the whole purpose of art is that it's about conveying feelings, it's about conveying an emotion and we say that the best art is the art that does that. And so the, re the reasons why the government compromises that is because we see that artists by their nature, by the nature of their profession, are strapped for resources. So we say that if a huge funding pool exists, the problem with that is that the government has to set a criteria regarding the sort of art they want. And we say that homogenises the quality of the art that they sponsor. And, we, and it also means that fringe art isn't able to conform to that criteria and therefore it has no access. And so because artists are trying to meet the government's criteria, that means that their art is less free because they have to conform to the government's agenda or what the government wants. And finally, we say that the reason it undermines the quality of art is because it gives competitors who are being sponsored an unfair advantage over those who aren't. And that means there's an imbalance and so people can't decide on the quality. So let's go quality in the best way as opposed to the market. So ladies and gentlemen, what I've just presented you with is that we believe market, the market should decide what is the best art because we don't think the government are the fit people to decide and we think that it undermines the overall quality. And so therefore, we're most proud to propose. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that the family side of the house has a very narrow-minded idea of what art actually is. They think art is a simple doodle, a simple picture, and a simple painting that um, might uh, exist or might not. But it isn't, ladies and gentlemen. We're here to say that art is an integral part of the culture. And art, to each person, is different, is unique, and is important. And so that's why we, as the negative side, that we don't know why the affirmative side of the house would want to ban um, this art and how and why, why there is a need to ban this art, why, uh, why there is a need to ban this art, which, because they've never stated an actual problem in why we need to um, actually take this measure that we need to stop funding. They never said there might be a problem of resources, they never said that there might be a problem of favoritism. And, um, and by that, they never proved to us why exactly banning is needed. We say that we shouldn't ban um, state funding of the arts. We're saying that it's acceptable if the government wants to fund some arts when they see that it is necessary for the government to do so. Because there are some arts in the status quo, ladies and gentlemen, that are losing to other arts that exist. We, no, thank you. For example, the minority arts um, that derive from cultures that are, mi that are minority are losing against majority uh, arts and culture which have more people to preserve them. No, thank you. Um, as an example, the Ojibwe culture in, uh, as an, a Native American culture, only 10,000 people left are, uh, are, are left in the world to actually preserve that type of art. That art is losing and that art deserves attention, no thank you, from the government. Exactly because of that. And so we're, 
we'll be bringing um, to you the arguments on the first um, how we sh should not ban um, state funding of the arts because art is an integral part of the society, so it's justified if the government used taxpayers' money to give it. Hold on a second. Second, we'll talk to you about how this will prevent loss and disrespection for some arts uh, because what, that's what they're doing. They're letting some of minority arts just lose because nobody likes them. And third, my second speaker will be talking about how this will actually give potential for the nation and the country as a whole. Yes. What is so inherently good about art that the government should prioritise spending money on that right, as opposed to other things? But ma'am, we're not saying that the government should be prioritising spending money specifically on art than other things. We think that any government is a good government and they know how to spend their money wisely. There will be no government that suddenly chooses that art is better than education, that art is better than healthcare. Governments know where their money needs to go. And government, even if they don't know, knows that the society is there, no thank you, to check up on them. The society asks us that education be first, that health be first, that all security be first, all the important things are first. But art, no thank you is also an important part that, that the society wants. And so art deserves funding if the government decides that, um, that it is necessary to give funding. So before I go into my argument, I'd first like, no thank you, to be back there, um, three parts of three arguments. On first, how they say that we want, um, uh, um, we want art to be appreciated because we want because we want appreciation for the, pe for the people. No, thank you. They never exactly explain to us why. If the government funds this art, people then won't, um, suddenly won't appreciate it because the government is not setting any criteria specifically for what um, for what art they're going to choose. Because we see if no, thank you. If there is an art that is good, if there is an art that likes that is liked by many people, then that art will continue to exist because there is enough support for it. This debate is about that art which are losing arts which are the minority and which deserves to be upheld because they are part and they are the culture of some society but which can't uphold themselves and so the government should be helping them because the government sees that it's necessary. No thank you. And so, uh, and the second part of their argument which uh, how it's, it's not necessary for the government. I've already explained before how it is necessary because the government needs to see that every single person, no matter the minority or the majority, is important and that every single person should be protected, especially when their art is looking over the other. And also the point about the compromising the freedom, I've already rebutted also because, as I said before, the government doesn't have a criteria. They say that this art is life, we we'll suddenly do this art. That doesn't happen with the government. No, thank you. If an art exists and if an art is liked by many people and has enough support by people say buying that art, then we say that's fine. The, uh, then we say that's fine because they don't need funding and the government won't give them funding if they see that they don't need it. This is especially for minority arts and the affirmative side of the house has to prove why minority arts, why arts that are losing shouldn't be funded by the government. So stepping on to my first argument about how art is an integral part of the society. Now ladies and gentlemen, we see that our whole civilization, our country, our people started with culture, with art. We see that um, uh, okay, at the starting of civilization, people started with singing a song to each other, handing down culture, over culture, poems, literature, cave paintings, music, and that culture, no thank you, still exists in our society today in the form of art. We still have, no thank you, we still have that culture standing and we still have that culture existing because we have art. And that's why, that's why the society, no thing, is so strong about art. That's why a lot of people in the society love art so much because they see themselves reflected in them. They see the society's identity, the society's culture reflected in that art. And that's why we say that it is uh, acceptable if the government finds art because art is that important to the society. Art holds an integral part, no thank you, for the society, especially for the ones that are losing, when they see that, when the government sees that the identity of some of these people aren't being upheld, that they can't promote their own art, that their art is losing to other art, we say that the government needs, no thank you, that the government then needs to give funding to that art because they see that it is necessary because art is important because it is the culture of that person because it is the identity of the person. That's why we have Indian people who love um, Bollywood music so much because they see that it is their culture even though it might not seem that big. It is their reflection, their identity that's reflected into it. And so that's why we say that it is justified for the government to give funds to uh, give funds to the arts because arts is an integral part of the society and arts is important to the society because arts is the society's culture. No thank you. So stepping on to my second argument about how this would prevent loss and disrespection um, for some arts. No thank you. As I've explained to you um, before how there are arts 
many forms of arts in the uh, in our world existing because there are also many forms of culture. But unfortunately, there are cultures that are uh, more major than others, and there are cultures that are minor. And uh, for these minor uh, for these minor cultures, what tends to happen is that these cultures are being forgotten for, by the government. These cultures don't have a chance to. No, thank you. These cultures don't have a chance to also promote themselves, to also still stay living because there's just simply not enough people who are interested, not enough people from that country who are interested in still promoting that culture. For example, uh, once again, the Native American ethnic of Ojibwe. Over 80% of that culture here is only 60 years, is over 60 years old. The younger generation don't know how to, don't know the things about their own culture. The younger generation don't know the language of their own culture. Only 10,000, most uh, of the people, most of them are the old ones, are the ones who are still interested in that culture. And so what happens is the culture that should be existing in the society, that culture that needs to exist because it's what the societies want, is tend to be being forgotten. And the government should be taking care of this because all arts are important to be provided because all arts are the culture of these people. Now what happens if we ban them, if we go with the affirmative side of the house proposal, is that the cultures that are less favoured than the other, that are less liked by the other, are just being ignored, you know, are just being let down when that culture holds so much of an identity of a person and we say that that's not right, that that's not fair because what we want is still for every culture, every group in our country to be treated the same. And when we see that one of them is more vulnerable than the other, and when one of them is losing to the other, we say that it is the government's duty to then give that funding to them, to then um, put incentive to other people, to actually people of that culture who might not be interested in it, to be more interested in it, for that culture to still exist. And what we say with government's funding, we can help to facilitate that culture to other people who might not know it. We can help facilitate the arts, and we can still help facilitate the arts so people are interested so people see that this culture is one of the things that we have in our country, one of the identities of our country. So what have we have proven to you today, ladies and gentlemen, is that we say that the government, uh, it is acceptable for the government to give funding for, the, um, for arts in society because art is an integral part of society and society loves art so it's justified to use taxpayers' money for their own benefit. And second, we talked to you about how this would prevent loss and disrespection for art because then uh, we see that this gives an incentive for those acts that are being lost to be then promoted, and that's why we, as the negative side of the house, are begging you to oppose. Poems about Swiss cheese, toilet seats that make donkey noises, or maybe interpretive bohemian dance. Is this art? Which of these are art? What do you think? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the question the proposition supports, is what art do you like and what do you think of art? Under the opposition, uh, what the opposition supports is government criteria, deciding what is good art, deciding what art should be pursued, and deciding exactly what art should be promoted. And this is the fundamental clash we see today. So before I move on to my substantive, I'm going to be looking at this idea about what is the status quo with government funding of arts and is there a criteria for it or is the funding everybody free for all willy-nilly as the opposition wants you to believe. But then secondly I'm going to be looking at the fundamental two ideas brought up by the opposition. And these are about firstly is art an integral inherent benefit good to society and secondly if we do not fund minority art for example will it disappear? So on to this first idea about what is the status quo with government funding. Well, our first proposition told you very clearly that what works is there is a specific criteria at the moment. And this criteria includes things like what you do, how old you are, what your ambitions are. You apply for funding, and this includes things like an artist's doll, and you apply for funding and you can get declined or accepted. And this, and this is dependent on if the government department approves you or not. They don't fund all types of art, ladies and gentlemen. You know, thank you. For example, rap music is not funded in many countries of the world because the government doesn't consider it art, even though thousands and thousands of other people do. So this is the kind of criteria which our first speaker told you politicizes art, these political motives, and homogenizes it. So what we see in fact is that there is a criteria, so not all art gets funding, but the second question we have to look at is, is art integral good? And this was just a, a asserted by the opposition that, well, we, I was waiting to be pointed to an actual concrete benefit of art, but all I heard was that it reflects our culture and it reflects our identity, and therefore it's an inherent good. 
And this linked on to the idea about minority art, in particular about it's an inherent good and if we don't fund it, it will disappear. Well, we've got a very simple response to this. And that the fatal error the opposition made was equating the size of a culture to the same demand for the art. And we say that is fundamentally not true. And we point you to things like Aboriginal art, like Maori art, like Native American Indian art that they pointed us to. The worldwide demand for this unique, special and interesting art is, has existed, will always exist, and continues to grow, ladies and gentlemen, despite the fact that culture continues to diminish naturally in, time, in terms of size. Now, thank you. So, size of a culture does not equate with the demand of the art. And so what I say as far as, no thank you, the other example that we were pointed to was Bollywood and how we need to subsidise this. Ladies and gentlemen, Bollywood is more um, is gro higher grossing than Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, so this is hardly an example of where the government really needs to step in or else it's going to get crushed. So we yeah. say that on this issue of minority art, the demand will exist, particularly with overseas buyers, so these people won't get crushed. But what art we will see getting crushed under the opposition is fringe art, is political art, is art that is anti-establishment and under the government's um, criteria of subsidisation does not receive money, no thank you. So now I want to turn to my substantive, and my, first, and my two substantive points are about how government uh, subsidising of art is fundamentally unfair and not the role of the government, and secondly, how cutting cash under our model, how cutting the cash handouts encourages more engagement between artists and their communities. So on to this first point. Now what we say is it's the role of the government to fairly provide for and to fairly allocate for its citizens. And we say that the subsidising of the arts is not fair and it is unbalanced. And these are the reasons why it's wrong and should be banned. Now we see this on two levels, ladies and gentlemen, about why it's fair and why it's unbalanced. Now the first reason it's unfair is because industries that don't get subsidisation, that's hugely unfair for them. For example, other pursuits such as one we're all familiar with, debating, ladies and gentlemen, many of the countries in the world, their governments don't subsidise debating, so it's massively unfair for other industries. But it's also unfair for artists within that industry of art, like rap music, which I pointed to you, which do not get funding, and my first speaker told you all about this. But the third level of why it's unfair is within that industry, no, oh, I'll take you in a moment. Some people get the money and some get tax breaks, like in Ireland, where you too would own the government the equivalent of nearly a billion pounds because they get tax break just because they're an artist, ladies and gentlemen, while your average working Irish family doesn't get a thing. Fair isn't, isn't, isn't a condition where everybody gets the same thing, but when, when the government gives those who need most, that's why when there is a, when there is a food, you Thank don't you. give everyone food, but those who only need it. Thank you. Well, you point us to the example of Bollywood, which hardly needs government subsidisation, but fair is about giving people things fairly, and is about providing for the most people. So something that isn't demanded for by the people and that isn't supported by its own people doesn't categorise as the government's need to step in when the public won't, ladies and gentlemen. So the second reason why it's unfair um, and not the government's role is what the government does spend money on is things that are a public good. And my first speaker told you about this, is infrastructure, is roads, is hospitals, is education, is things that actually benefit everyone. No, thank you. And we say that it's firstly bad to force and encourage the consumption of art, like here's some Picasso, we say it's good for you, take it now. But moreover, what's even worse is using your money to do that when you don't want to, ladies and gentlemen. This is the second reason why government subsidisation is wrong. And so now on to my second substantive about how cutting these cash handouts encourages more engagement between artists and their own community. So when you are an artist getting held up by the government, buy things like the artist doll and buy things like these conditional subsidies, you no longer need to rally for community support. You no, no, no longer, I'll take you in a moment, need to seek patrons and need to hold charity rallies and need to get involved. You honestly do believe that artists become artists because they love doing their arts? Um, yes, they do love doing their arts, but when the government is paying them to sit around and do their arts, they don't need to reach out to more people, they don't need to find patrons, they don't need to seek commissions because the government is paying their, them to sit there and do it. And we say that when you are an artist, um, you need to be engaging with these kind of people who are the very consumers of the art and the very identity you're reflecting, the very culture you're supposed to be representing, as the opposition pointed out. 
And, um, and so when you take away these conditional government subsidies, you encourage community interaction and patrons and commissions and fundraisers, even things like auctions getting set up to cover the money. You get the community involved, the very people you are probably supposed to be representing and, um, and speaking out for as the opposition realise. So what we see is that government funding of arts um, is, is wrong because it is not the government's job. It is unfair on people within that industry and outside that industry. It discourages community engagement. And we say that an arts value is attributed by the consumer and the market can provide you with this. And so for all these reasons, we say that th there should be an absolute ban on the state funding of arts. Rap music won't qualify, they said, because governments don't see rap music as arts. Well, we say no, ladies and gentlemen, government won't fund rap music because rap music in itself has already got enough support, sufficient support to already be popular. They don't need the extra help by the government. They say that subsur subsursive arts, arts that criticize the government, will not be funded. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about subsur subsursive arts. We're, not all governments are like Cuba, who just recently arrested a rap musician because they criticized the government. We believe that what's important here there are the arts that need to be protected. These are the minority arts. No, it's not Bollywood, because we said that Bollywood already has enough support and people do like it. But what about the other types of minority arts that don't have as much support as Bollywood and yet still deserve to exist? Now, we believe that it's not just about the size of the people who actually believe in the arts, but also the amount of people that realizes the aesthetics of that art. This is the reason why they point at Aborigines and the Maoris. That's great, the fact that they are still existing, because people are aware that they exist. But there are also other cultures, like the Ojibwe, no thank you both of you, that people don't know about it, don't know about how crucial it is for us to preserve these kinds of arts. So we're not talking about giving tax breaks to you too, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about giving access, giving resources to those who need the resources to be able to preserve their arts. This is what we are doing today in the status quo. Now, point of information. No, thank you, ma'am. So before I move on to my point of substantive, I will first prove to you that all five of their points pass no ground by, um, by the end of my speech. First of all, no, thank you, ma'am. Talk about appreciation should only come from the people and not from the government. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that appreciation will come from the people, but not necessarily all the time. Because, as they said, that all arts are different. I personally don't think a bunch of lines and a bunch of blocks is beautiful, but some people do, and some people will, and continue to do so. We can't simply rely on the majority to decide what needs to be appreciated, because Arts change all the time. People used to like Renaissance arts, but not so much anymore. Now we prefer the more contemporary arts. So arts change. And so the government has the right to um, still fund those arts that they believe is necessary. And I thank you, ma'am. Second of all, the issue about the market, that suddenly artists will become better because they see their own incentive to create profit, and they're not going to get just money from the government. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you, ma'am. The artist's incentive isn't just profit. Artists become artists because they love being artists. This is the reason why there are artists that still paint on the streets. They don't get money for it, they don't get much money for it, but yet they still do it because they believe in what they do, ladies and gentlemen. So therefore, um, there is no need to improve the market as, as if it is we're talking about the competing um, banks or financial institutions. So thank you. you. Um, so, uh, also the third idea that diversity would cease to exist. Well, ladies and gentlemen, diversity will exist under their proposal because now they're choosing that some arts deserve to exist and some arts don't. So, it's, they are saying that we need to open the arts to a market as if it's a survival of the fittest. They are the ones that are going to eliminate the diversity of arts. We believe that all arts are important, I think you meant. And so, all the three points brought up by the first speaker have fallen. Moving into what the second speaker brought up. First of all, about how it's unfair, and second of all, about how it encourages artists to engage. No, thank you, ma'am. First of all, they said that it's unfair to other sectors. Now we question them, then what is fair? Are they going to subsidize all arts? Is that the definition of fair? Is that fair? And is that what they want to do? Well, we said, make your mind up. Moreover, they talk about how it's unfair to other sectors like roads and hospitals. But again, we have proven to you from our very beginning that government isn't going to prioritize arts. Government is going to allocate the arts with proportions. That's what governments do. So moving on, that, that this idea of unfairness doesn't even exist. Moving into the fifth argument, I thank you, ma'am, that we need to encourage artists to engage and how artists won't engage if they have funding. But ladies and gentlemen, they didn't really see the link. We, they didn't prove us the link as to why artists would stop engaging when government gave them funding. We believe that 
Art itself is an expression that is only valuable when it's appreciated by other people. This in itself is already enough to, for artists to realize that they do need to reach out to other people because if nobody knows of their arts, if nobody appreciates their arts, there's no point of him making those arts. No, thank you, ma'am. So yes, they will still engage regardless of whether it's funding or not. So then their idea that we need to bend state funding is absolutely necessary has fallen. Yes, ma'am? Do you think it's appropriate that when an artist is struggling, he gets money from the government? Or when a mechanic is struggling, he doesn't get anything. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about whether or not we should give money to everyone that is poor. If we want to have a debate about welfare states, let's do it, but we're not going to do it today. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, the crucial point here is that we need to preserve all arts, including the minority arts that are in and that do need funding. And so I will bring to you now to our third argument where we would not ban state funding, which is because actually preserving arts, it has a good financial potential for the country and the nation as a whole. Now, as we know, arts itself is a reflection of culture. Art itself is an attraction. It's the national identity. It's what attracts, what makes a nine, one nation is attractive when compared to other nations. No, thank you, ma'am. This is the reason why people love to travel to see different arts. For example, people travel to Cambodia to see Angkor Wat. People travel to India to see Al Fakir Mohammed Man to see the dances. People go to Australia because they're curious to hear the didgeridoo. Yes? Doesn't the fact that people are willing to pay to go wherever they're willing to go show that the market will provide whatever art people want? Well, actually, ma'am, you're still missing the idea that not everybody knows about every single cultures that exist. We say that it's great that there are majority cultures that people know and people travel to it, but that's not always the case with minority cultures. Now, I will, as we know, that going back to my argument, that art itself is important to preserve because every single art has the potential of a market. For example, this is the reason why the governments of Cambodia and Thailand are fighting over currently the Priya Bayer temple in, in their border because they realize that there is potential for income there for tourists because they want to see these temples and they want to appreciate these temples. Moreover, there are potential for incomes because people actually buy the art, because there's tourism, and because there are actually jobs that can be offered to these artists that want to uh, implement, uh, to actually explore these arts. So thank you, ma'am. However, this also currently in the status quo, not necessarily every country is appreciating all arts. Not necessarily every country, every government is promoting all arts. There, there are smaller minority arts that are also unique, and yet the government simply look, overlooks them, simply neglects them because they're not big enough, like what the affirmative team is doing here. And yet what the governments need to realize is that there, are, there is still a market for even these small arts as well, the ones that are dying. This is the reason why there are fanatic collectors that come travel all over the world, are willing to spend their money so that they can go into the deep pockets of every country to, realize, to see all the deep, uh, go into the deep pockets and see all the little minority cultures, and so they can appreciate the arts and buy the arts from those cultures. Now, if these minority cultures, if these minority arts actually grow to become even bigger, therefore it can contribute a lot more. This is why we believe that the state can, is to, and is justified, no thank you ma'am, to give funding to these arts because if they grow and are able to grow, we, those, these arts are also going to generate income for the nation as a whole. Small arts and small cultures sometimes get neglected. It's time for the government to see the benefits and the potential of these arts too. So now, ladies and gentlemen, by the end of the day, we not only have proven to you that the affirmative currently has no ground out of their five arguments as to why it's absolutely necessary to ban state funding for arts, but we have also proven to you that, in fact, this will create backlash because, first of all, it's government responsibility to protect vulnerable arts. Moreover, because the existence of these arts, we cannot afford to lose these arts because it benefits the souls, the people who actually want the art to exist, and that's what the taxpayers' money needs to be used for. But more importantly, because also there is financial benefit from preserving these arts. So in the end, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to protect rap music, or we're not going to protect those arts that are, that are already currently existing, but if we are talking about arts that still need funding, that the affirmative largely ignores today, that's when we believe that we cannot absolutely ban state funding for these arts too. Which model is fairer in terms of the way that the government allocates its resources? 
So let's turn to the first question, which is who is better at deciding what art is? And what we came up very clearly at the start of this debate and said was that art is completely subjective. There is no way by which you can measure the quality of art or how good it is other than through your own opinion and your own perception of that art. And the opposition completely accepted this premise. So what we said was that flowing from that, it just follows that people therefore are the only ones who can actually decide for themselves which art is good. And we don't think that the government is justified, no thank you, to get up and say, we think this is art, we think this should be promoted, we think this should be supported, and this should not. And we gave examples of things like rap music, which governments just don't appreciate because it doesn't appeal to that certain group of bureaucrats sitting in that room. But we don't think that's a good enough reason to say that rap music no thank you, should be disadvantaged over other types of music or other types of art in general, simply because the government doesn't like it. We showed you a very clear market mechanism through which the only art which exists is art which people appreciate. No thank you. And we told you about the way it is, the other ways in which uh, people can receive funding for their art. We told you about how people find patrons who are willing to support that artist throughout their career. We told you about how different people commission certain types of art which they want and the artist wants to provide them with. We told you, no thank you, about how the community can provide funding to these artists. And we told you that the key difference between all of these market mechanisms for providing funding to the art and the government providing funding to the art is that these people are firstly spending their own money and secondly, they are the ones who are consuming the good. And that is why we stand for the principle that people are the only ones who can decide what and what isn't art. And the government, furthermore, is bad, actually, at deciding. Yeah. So let's move on, no thank you, now to the quality of the art that we get. And the key contention that we had from the opposition here was that with our, with, with our model, what's going to happen is that we will still, they've conceded we're going to get all the art that people want, but they've said that we're not going to get the art that people don't want. And they said that that was a bad thing. And when they were talking about this, they pointed to the example of Indigenous art. But all of the examples that they pointed to us of Indigenous art that they think is good and they think should still exist, will still exist under our model. Yeah. Because they pointed us, no thank you, to Native Americans and said there are only 10,000 of them left. That means their art's going to go too, unless the government funds it. But what we told you is that Indigenous groups like this, who provide a very specific kind of art that you can't get anywhere else, that is a unique culture to it and a unique identity as an, and as an expression of that, we said that people are falling over themselves to buy that art. We told you about Aboriginal art and how the, the price of an average canvas of this kind of art is just skyrocketing because of the fact that people really appreciate it. And they yet to give us an example of an actual indigenous culture which produces yeah. art which they think would cease to exist under a model we're still waiting for. Yes. Aboriginal art is famous because the government promotes it, because it's part of every brochure and every advertisement that deals with tourism, man. Well, no, that's simply not true, firstly. I think of any country, we see the race relations between the Australian government and the Aborigines is actually fairly intense one. And only just last year was the first time they decided to apologise for the hideous act of taking children away from their families in the Aboriginal community. So we just don't think that's true. Secondly, we think it's fine for governments to promote tourism and promote indigenous cultures. That's not subsidising the arts. That's not subsidising the artists. That's not giving them the doll when no one else gets it. So that's why we say that it's just simply not true that this kind of good art is not going to exist. But furthermore, we pointed you to two key benefits in terms of the kind of art we get under our home. And the first benefit was we said that you get more freedom because of the fact that you no longer have the big pot of cash sitting up there and the criteria which you have to fit to get that cash. We told you that the government has only a limited amount of money to spend on art, therefore it has to choose who it's going to give that money to. And to do that, it decides what kind of art it wants, what age of person it wants, what kind of general, um, I think what the general kind of vibe and theme of this art is, or indeed they might exclude entire categories like rap. And we said that that means that it encourages yeah. artists and gives them a direct incentive to conform to that criteria because that's how they get funding. But if things like rap music and Bollywood are um, uh, uh, can't support them own enough and can get enough um, can get enough supporters uh, who like their music, why would they need that pot of cash? Well, we don't think they need it, but we think that people who do need it are, for example, those on the fringe who do a very specific art, things like body tattooing, okay, yeah. which some people appreciate, no thank you, and, and other people don't. But we say that if you're a body tattooist, but what the government actually wants is, for example, uh, 
nice body art that's flowers and butterflies and not your body art which has messages against the government. We say that if you want money from that government, you're going to conform to their criteria. You're going to say, my opinion and my full mass vision is this, but the government wants that and they're going to give them what they want because that's how they get money and all people need money to eat and to live, ladies and gentlemen, despite what the opposition may think. And the only response that we've ever had to them from this is that the government doesn't set a criteria, that it just sponsors nice indigenous cultures. But that's just simply not true. The government sponsors all kinds of things. For example, we see high levels of sponsorship for things like opera, for things like orchestras. And we showed you, for example, that the uh, this San Francisco Cisco Philharmonic Orchestra is one which gets no government funding but still exists because people like it, while one's like the Auckland Philharmonic Orchestra, which is bad but still funded by the government because the government like, likes orchestras plays to half-empty halls, ladies and gentlemen. So we can see that there must be a criteria. There is a criteria. No, thank you. And this means that art is less free. People are going to conform and homogenise their form of expression, and they're not going to criticise the government and criticise society, which is what art is all about. And we never had a response to any of that from the opposition. No, thank you. And secondly, we said that we're actually going to get more engagement in the system, because it means artists actually have to go to the community as their first port of call, and not to the government. And we think that that's a good thing. And the opposition told us that already artists can go to the community, and we agree, but our system actually makes them do that, because we think artists are a lot more likely to want to go and fill out a form and get government lots of millions of dollars of government money than making effort to go out into the community and hold fundraisers and make gallery visits and hold raffles. We just think that artists generally, given the choice, are going to choose to take the easy option. But we think the hard option is actually a better one for society because it means that the community is going to actually interact with these artists. It means that they're going to develop an appreciation because they're operating at a grassroots personal level with these artists, we think that that is a good thing that our model provides. And finally, in terms of fairness, we just think it's simply unfair that if you're an artist, if you're you too, you can get billions of dollars worth of tax breaks from the government, but if you're someone who's a successful lawyer, you don't get those same tax breaks. That's not good enough. And that's one of the key ways in which the government does fund the arts. So because of the fact that our model provides the best way of discerning what is good art and what is not, and it provides people with what they actually want. Because of the fact that our system results in more free expression from artists, and because of the fact that it's more fair, we are most proud to stand up and say that we should banish all government funding of the arts and leave it to the people. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the parameter that New Zealand proposes to us is when people like it, then the market will, will save that certain art. But to which they never exactly explain to us how come that what people like will always be the same for 10 years, will always be the same for 100 years. Now, say that now people like rap, and then just years. And then in 100 years, suddenly people start to think that rap is boring and, and probably jazz is interesting. But what, what do we have? Jazz is gone. Why? Because there is no ability for it to survive. Because, because there is no ability for it to be facilitated by the government to actually interact with the society, to actually emerge themselves from the society. Is this justice? There are three questions that should be asked in today's debate. First, what exactly is art and how best to appreciate it? Second, is it fair when we give protection to those need, or is it unfair? Third, will funding the art then result in a better art, or will it destroy it? Let's come to the first point. Now, no ma'am, the first notion that I've heard from the proposition team is on how they believe that appreciation should come from the people. But they seem to neglect the point of my first speaker, in which we have clearly stated to you that art is an identity, it's a form of expression of a nation, of an ethnic. No, ma'am. So, when we see that an ethnic is expressing themselves, there is no reason for the government to not respect this ethnic. Why? Because that ethnic is also a citizen. So, it essentially, no, ma'am, what exactly New Zealand is doing is that they are not respecting the people. They are not respecting an ethnic that's supposed to be the subject of the government. Therefore, we believe that the government should play part, should give appreciation. Then again, they said that let's the markets choose, no, ma'am, and it's okay if some die, well, just die. This is exactly when the government does not respect the citizen. Where, where, we, where we believe that the government is supposed to protect those who are the most vulnerable, supposed to protect those who need protection. No, ma'am. Now, 
art in itself is a form of expression of an ethnic, is what I said. For example, the Kazakh art in Mongolia, or the Ojibwe uh, language in somewhere in Australia, I think. Uh, no, man. And uh, Indian, uh, na na Native American in America, this is a form of expression of ethnic. This is how they express themselves. And when, the, when it is not appreciated by the government, government has not fulfilled its duty in respecting the citizens. No, man. In respecting the people which they're supposed to respect. Furthermore, how do you guarantee that art which lives today will always be the favorable one? What's not famous today, how do you get it that what's not famous today will never be famous? When it is not funded, no ma'am, it will be gone. As a result, it has never had a chance to emerge itself. This is what we call this injustice. You are favoring one art over the other based on the market, leaving this unfavorable one no chance at all to emerge to the market, to interact with the society. Is this what we want to hear? No ma'am, we say no. Then again, they believe that it is not needed because if they, they are unique enough, they will survive. But the real question is, there won't be enough resource for them to sustain. Because when they do not have enough resources, they cannot even make this art, they cannot even produce the art, they cannot even sell the art to the people because they cannot produce it. I'll take you in a moment, ma'am. So it literally shows you that we, there is a need of help from the government. And it is actually the way we appreciate because government is supposed to appreciate its own citizen. Yes, ma'am. homogenizes art and um, cuts out French art, say anti-establishment alternative art. Well, that is actually already responded by my second speaker, but I will further in depth in the second contention that I will address now. Is it exactly fair when we give protection to those needed? That will be the second notion, but let me finish the first notion first, in which the definition of fair in the government point of view. What exactly the government should do is not to give everyone the same treat, uh, the same amount of money, say, but it is when the government protect those who need protection. This is exactly why when we donate our money, we donate our money to those who need. We don't donate our money to rich people to just fill their pockets for an extra $100. No, ma'am. So it clearly shows you that what exactly is fair when government protects the weakest to make an equal playing field so that everybody has the same chance to survive. Everybody has the same chance to sustain. No, ma'am. When you do not fund, as I've said, what exactly you are doing is that you are letting a certain unlucky one, just because they're unlucky, to be not, to not emerge, to be not... Uh, well, catch by, by the society. No, ma'am. So I clearly showed you that that is unfair because you're not giving these uh, cultures equal chance. That is why we need protection for the most vulnerable one in order for them to have an equal playing field. And that is the way we reach fairness. But then again, no, ma'am, no, I'll answer this. It's on how they believe that there will be criteria. Government will be subjective. To which we say government is not that stupid. They seem to believe that government only consists of one person. No, ma'am. They seem to believe that government only consists of one person. Say America only consists of George W. Bush. Therefore, ma when, when Mr. Bush likes Oprah, he will subsidize opera. No, government consists of hundreds of people, and not everybody likes opera, not everybody likes rap. So we say that this, their assumption that this will be criteria that will be subjective is clearly an assumption that cannot be valid. There are control, there are check and balance, and it's not that if government will just subsidize something because they like it, it's because they, need, they see the need of this certain sector to be subsidized. No, ma'am. Now, on the third notion that arises, it will, it will not reach a society, to which we say it does. My second, second, second speaker has clearly said it to you. When we sell our art, that would generate, uh, regenerate income to our, to our society, which would benefit everybody. It doesn't that prove that it actually reaches society? <laughs> Furthermore, no ma'am, society likes art. Society likes art. There is nobody that doesn't like any single music at all. Of course, frankly, unless some. Well, some strange people, maybe. But then again, we believe that at the end of the day, no man, when we subsidize this art, when art is sustained, they can reach the people, they can entertain the people, and that's how the subsidized, the, sorry, the funding on the arts will reach the people. So at the end of the day, is it fair? Yes. Does it your society? Yes. Third question. Will funding the art result in better art? Now there has been a lot of assumption that comes from the affirmative side of the house in which they believe that art will no longer be free in its form when, we, when there is a funding from the government because government will then give a certain uh, limitation to the art. To which we say this is a really false assumption. If it is really true, no ma'am, then how come Baptic clothing in Indonesia, which is frankly subsidized, keep on developing in its motive, keep on developing in its market? Then how come also dances still develops with the modern world? Say, Chinese traditional dances, which, which used to only use pentatonic a tone, no ma'am, now even use modern drum. It shows you that it still develops and there is no such as the government limit them at some point. Of course, no ma'am. Furthermore, when it develops, when it becomes more creative, government will be more, it will be more attractive for the people. It will have a higher selling price. And of course, why not government prefer this? Yes, ma'am. How does the government 
government subsidise art if it doesn't have a criteria? Now, we believe the criteria here would, would be the, 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 that it would subsidize to those who need it, to those who, who basically believe that if we do not fund them, then they cannot sustain themselves. This is exactly why the United States does not subsidize Hollywood, Mr. Speakers. Now, second is that they believe art will then be better because there will be incentive for someone to make, uh, to make art just because of profit. No, because we make art because we love it, because this is their hobby. Just because there is a profit, that doesn't mean that I, who quite frankly cannot draw, would then suddenly draw because there is a profit. No, Mr. Speakers, you do art because you love it. And that's why profit is not an incentive for this art, for this artist to be better. It's when we facilitate them to develop. And at the end of the day, we believe that the assumption of they would not engage with the economy is also a false assumption. Because first, they love it, and when they love it, they would expand their creativity there. And if it's really true that there is no engagement, again, how come the Chinese pentatonic uh, music now develops into a more modern one, now develops into modern drum, or even theater now still opens to critic, which means they engage the people. However, when you do not fund this, all this will be gone. All this will be gone because they, they cannot even live, they cannot even exist in the society anymore. So at the end of the day, Team New Zealand has failed to prove to you that their parameter is actually a just parameter. Because they're leaving it to the market, which always changes. What we need to do is to give everybody equal chance to show themselves that they're worth it to the market. At the end of the day, we, negative side of the house, love art, and you want it to still exist. First of all, we need to decide who is the preposition team and which one's the opposition. The preposition keeps asking us, what is your criteria for the government to subsidize? Well, that's actually not our job as the opposition. It's their job to prove to us that there is a problem with the status quo. What is the problem with the status quo? The fact that there are minority arts that are dying and that the government is is either funding it or there are governments that choose to let it leave and leave it to the market, which is what the affirmative wants to do today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that the, the problem needs to be solved, that we need to save these dying arts and these dying cultures. Every art deserves to exist, ladies and gentlemen. But the, uh, the affirmative says that we, didn't, we don't need to fund some of these arts. And so this debate boils down to the two initial questions that the affirmative needs to prove um, today. First of all, the fact that art does or doesn't need funding. And third, second of all, is there benefits or harms in banning the state funding for the arts? Now regarding the first question of does some arts actually need funding, well, the affirmative doesn't seem to think so. They believe that the market will control it, that the market will continue the existence of all arts. They believe that if it's a majority enough, then it will continue to exist. And if it's unique and minor enough, it's still going to continue to exist. Now, we agree that if they are major enough and have enough support, then we don't need to fund them. But we are talking about the unique ones, the small ones. They said that, um, these continue to exist. Well, these minor arts can only continue to exist in special cases where governments actually promote them, such as the average, such as the Maori culture in Australia and in New Zealand. Now, we believe that the affirmative never once denied the fact that there are dying cultures and what are we going to do about them? We point to various examples, such as the Ojibwe culture in, us, in America right now. The fact that people don't even know they exist. People don't even know what their art is like. But we need to show people that these arts also have potential and also needs to be appreciated. And this is why these minority arts do need funding and do need saving. Now, moving on to the second question about is there benefits or is there harms in banning um, State funding, uh, state funding of arts. Now, the affirmative burden of proof to you here is actually to prove to us what are the benefits of banning arts. But instead, they choose the other way around and point out the potential harms of actually funding these arts. They point out that there's going to be less interaction between artists and people. They point out that it's going to result in worse arts. And then they're going to talk about how it will lead to conformity of arts. Now, all of these three points we have proven to you to fail. First of all, about less interaction. They didn't prove to us why state funding equals less in interaction. Currently in the sense where there is state funding, and as my third speaker have just shown me, that people still continue to appreciate these arts and there is still interaction. Because these artists need interaction regardless of whether or not they have money. Because their art doesn't mean anything if there is no interaction and if there is no appreciation. Now, also they argue that there is a harm of funding because it will lead to worse arts because people don't have any incentives to be good anymore because they already got money. But again, ladies and gentlemen, these artists have their own incentives. They, they chose to go here because they want people to appreciate their art and people do.
and third of all, how they believe that there will be suddenly conformity because the government decides one type of art, and that's the one we're going to subsidize. But again, ladies and gentlemen, we have proven to you that there is a system of check and balance, that the government doesn't, aren't all going to be suddenly authoritarian regimes that decide which arts deserve to exist or not. We believe that there is a check and balance within the community and within the government itself, that no such thing will, um, will continue to occur. In fact, less diversity is exactly what the affirmative is proposing because they believe that some arts can just die because the market doesn't want to hold it, ladies and gentlemen. And yet they didn't prove to us, they didn't rebut the fact that there are harms to actually banning state funding, such as the fact that people are going to lose appreciation of arts, such an integral part of their community. Also, they didn't rebut the fact that people are going to lose a potential source of income from the nation because if we preserve these cultures, these arts, people are going to come as tourists and buy these arts and that is also potential for income for the nation. They didn't rebut that at all, ladies and gentlemen. So in the end, what is the problem with the status quo is that there are dying cultures and what should the government do? Not simply to let them die and lose all of these benefits that come from actually preserving the arts. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of this debate, I set up, a pri I set up what, the affirmative, what the proposition had to prove to win today's debate. And we had to prove that art is subjective, and so therefore people and the consumers should decide rather than the government. I told you that we had to prove that when the government subsidises art, that harms art as a whole. And I told you that we had to prove that it's unfair for the government to subsidise art and not the other things. And the opposition had to, pr had to prove to us that it, some art it should survive even when nobody wants it. And ladies and gentlemen, the very fact that the, the opposition failed to really grapple with this issue is telling of how impossible, of how untrue it is that